Okay. So we continue with the Chod Shabbat, but uh, let's start with the, some halachot of Shavuot, halachot, minagim. There's really, they're not that many, uh, not that many halachot of Shavuot. It's sort of, a, of all the Yamim Tovim, it's the one that doesn't have a, um, anything specific, at least in the, in the Torah, that is attached to it. The, uh, not even a date. The Torah doesn't even mention the date of Shavuot. It's the uh, completion of the cycle, starting with Pesach, ending in, uh, in Shavuot, and in the time of the Torah, even in the time of, the, of Hachamim, until they uh, fix the calendar, Shavuot could have happened at uh, the 5th, 6th, or 7th of Sivan, depending on the length of the two months of uh, Nisan and Iyal. Um, and the idea of Matan Torah, even though we understand that Matan Torah is related to the holiday, the Torah never mentions it, mentioned it as a, as a reason for the celebration of uh, uh, on Shavuot. And probably this is something that happened after the destruction, when Shavuot became devoid of uh, of content. You didn't have the sacrifices. You don't go to the temple. So what what do you do to make Shavuot special? Sukkot has the sukkah that you build. The uh, Pesach has matzot and the Seder, which was also after the destruction. But Shavuot has nothing. So Matan Torah became the main celebration. Similarly, on Simchat Torah. Shemini Atzeret. Shemini Atzeret was just a holiday that was related to the temple. Without the temple, there was no special meaning to Shemini Atzeret. So that came much later. The day was chosen to be the day of the conclusion of the Torah. And so maybe because Shavod didn't have that unique character like the other holidays, so over time, uh, new practices were added. The um, one of one of the uh, intriguing uh, uh, customs that practices that we don't, we're not sure what is the origin of is the uh, is eating dairy on Shavuot, not a problem for uh, n- not a problem for a very small you know portion of the population, or in the other's community those who are vegetarian but still eat dairy. If you are vegan or if you are you know meat lover, that becomes a problem. They I always hear the argument that people say, you can't have dairy on Shavuot, you can't have dairy at night, because you must eat meat during the holidays. And they quote this statement in the Talmud, en simha ela bebasar v'yain, uh, joy is always associated with meat and wine. So we, we, I'm not going to address that from the point of view of being a vegetarian or not, or our culture today, but even the statement as it is mentioned in Halakha, is uh, clearly referring only to the time of the temple. Uh, it's discussed several times, and the poskim say, this only refers to the time of the temple. If you came to Yerushalayim and you had to rejoice in the holiday, you had to eat meat. It doesn't apply to our days, to our time, whatever you want to eat, not only on Shabbat, not only on the holiday, on Shabbat as well. And that's important. It's written in the Shohan Aruch, but people sometimes neglect it. Or just they, they skip this halakha. Um, the Shohan Aruch says that even though we have the minhag of eating three meals on Shabbat, if you don't want to eat, if it's difficult for you, if you're not hungry, if you want to, you don't have to eat. You don't have to suffer. So that is a sort of a uh, um, a reminder to parents. I know that some parents sometimes fight with their children over eating on Shabbat. You know, you have to eat. It's Shabbat. No. You know, it would be much better if you tell me you don't have to eat because it's Shabbat. We want you to enjoy. You eat what you want to eat and remember it in a, in a, in a good and positive way. Um, the, of all the explanations of why we eat dairy, that, uh, you know, that the, uh, there's one explanation saying that the, uh, um, the dishes, the utensils that the Israelites used before Matan Torah became treif because they didn't know the laws and then they had to wait. That's the only thing they could eat was uh, was uh, was dairy. Um, it doesn't work very well uh, because what exactly, what kind of dairy food did they have in the desert? I don't, I can't imagine them, you know, boiling porridge or, or uh, pasta or anything like that. Everything was either cold or meat or roast meat. So that is not a very valid argument. Um, then 
there's the quote of the Pasuk, Dvash V'chalav Tachat L'Shonech, the Torah resembles honey and milk, which is a nice, uh, nice uh, symbolic uh, meaning. And uh, there are more, the, the, the one, the one uh, problem, by the way, with the dairy food is that in other places, dairy food is associated with making people sleepy. They say that the, uh, when uh, Sisra was running away from the battlefield and he came to Yael, he asked for water and she served him milk and milk or butter and it put him to sleep. So if you want to stay up all night, how can we uh, eat dairy? It's a problem. The answer to that is that the, uh, the custom of staying late on Shavuot night or all night is the very late custom. For the first time that it's mentioned is in the Zohar, uh, which means that before the 1400s, nobody knew about this uh, minhag. And um, I, I heard of, I don't, I'm not sure if I saw the article or I heard of the article, someone from YU who did the research and found out that for about 200 or 300 years, this minhag didn't really catch on until, until coffee became widely accessible and available throughout Europe and the Middle East and people could actually stay all night. Um, it's it's a nice it's a nice message of hey, we want to stay up all night and, and receive the Torah, unlike our forefathers who went to sleep. It's a nice story, it's a nice message. But as someone who teaches a lot of classes during the year, and we not thank God now we always have classes going on online. But when I used to teach in, in my in my synagogue. And people would come over for Shavuot night, all excited, falling asleep at 2 a.m. I, I would tell them, you know, I have a class every Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. Why don't you come then? Why don't you come when it's easily available and you're up? It's much better than staying uh, all night. So um, I think here also common sense is what's important. On Erev Shavuot, you want to stay late? Stay, but when you feel that you really need to sleep, don't fight your body. Go back and sleep and get a good good night's sleep and uh, and enjoy the holiday later on. Uh, back to the dairy food. I think that the um, um, the reason that I really like and makes sense is that this uh, this custom started in Europe because at the time the time of Shavuot was a uh, was a time where they had a lot of uh, a lot of milk. The the dairy farms were at a high level of production, so it was easier to eat dairy. It's not a good, uh, I mean, I think it's not a bad explanation. I actually like it. And it. Be it as it may, just enjoy the holiday. That's good. Um, the, uh, the other thing that's important, which unfortunately, where I am now, I'm a congregant. I just, just go to shul. They said that filah very late. I think we're going to pray at like, I don't know, 9.30 after the holiday is over. You could pray much earlier. And that is a halakha that also applies to... Um, to Shabbat. For some reason, in recent generations, there's been a push to delay the prayer of Shavuot in order to make the 50 days, the 49 days of the Omer, and make Shavuot on the 50th day. So they say it has to be 49 full days until after sunset, like like uh, Motzei Shabbat. Um, but that is really uh, a sort of a what they call a stringency that started in the last maybe 20, 30 years, which I think is not a humrah, it's a kula, because people are being lenient and allowing themselves to burden the people with late prayer and causing problems to families. The, uh, there's an interesting teshuvah of Turumat HaDeshen, Rabbi Israel Yisraelim, even though he doesn't agree with the practice, but he, he reports the practice in Europe in the 13 and 1400s of uh, doing Kiddush early in the day, meaning Friday night, not only people would do Kiddush early, they would do Tefillah, light candles, everything much earlier, so early that they would have time to finish the Tefillah, uh, have the meal, Kiddush, and then go for a walk for about, you know, when I was 30 minutes, half an hour, and go back home before sunset. So he's probably he speak, speaks of you know, the long summer days in Europe, 
but it was it was customary, and it's a good thing to do when you have kids at home and people um, and want to start earlier. Uh, what else about the Yom Tov? I think we mentioned it in the uh, probably last year when we when we did Halachot of Pesach, but I'll mention it again. the The issue of uh, using electricity in Yom Tov on Yom Tov is a uh, for some people, still hotly debated, the uh, um, the approach of most Sephardic rabbis when electricity was introduced was in, uh, discovered was that it is not a problem on the holiday. They considered it to be fire, but they said it exists like water in the pipes. You just move it from place to place. Today we know that it's not fire; it's a it's a physical and not a chemical reaction, and there's no um, relation whatsoever to the issue of fire and uh, since you could cook and use anything on, Shab- on Yom Tov you could re- use electricity as well the uh, um, I know that there was uh, in the uh, in parts of the Sephardic community especially in the certain community in Brooklyn and those who follow Rabbi Ovadia Yosef in Israel are very ardent, very uh, adamant in their argument against it that you cannot use electricity on Yom Tov, but when you trace it back, you see it started in the 70s. I've seen interviews with elders of the community who say, we always we always did that, not elders, just rabbis who know the halakha, and I, in my opinion, the reason that there was a push against using electricity on Yom Tov, which I remember started in the 70s, um, when I was a, was a teenager or a boy, a boy was that um, the rabbis were afraid, especially in Israel. That was the time when you had Israeli Israeli TV started broadcasting. And I think the great fear was, okay, now that you have electricity, you're going to watch TV, you, everything is going to just happen as, as, a, um, as an every other day. So we're better off telling people it's forbidden. And that is, we know that we have this uh, mentality of saying that it is forbidden. I think we... Uh, we discussed that when we spoke about the methodology of halacha, that it's a clear rule in the Shohan Aruch and in, in many other halachic writings that Keshem she'asur le'esor le'atir et ha'asur, kach asur le'esor et ha'mutar. Just as you cannot forbid, sorry, just as you cannot allow that which is forbidden, you cannot forbid that which is allowed. So if you want to make offense, if you want to tell people, don't use electricity on Yom Tov because it might lead you to using your, uh, uh, today, you know, all our smartphones, internet, whatever, but technically it's allowed. That's what you have to say. You can't say that it's categorically uh, forbidden. Um, so anything we could go back to our study of Shabbat. Any specific questions about Shavuot, about the holiday? From anyone you could send I it by chat. Yes, Shaina. Um, we've called our learning event for like five minutes before Shia because yeah. we could go ahead and start doing the Mari for Shia yeah. early because I did research a little. Yeah. But my question was, um, obviously we can't reheat the food that we're doing until after the stars are out. Right. But what about like Kiddush and eating? Should we wait? No, there's no need to wait. You could do, right, you could do the Kiddush, you could eat. Uh, earlier in the day, and you say Shavuot, that is uh, clearly written in the Talmud about the rabbis. It says, Rav Matzlei Shelayrev Shabbat 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 Motzei Shabbat. Sorry, he would pray. The rabbi, I think it's, uh, it's Rav, would pray the prayers of Shabbat on Friday, and the prayer of Motzei Shabbat on uh, on Shabbat. Of course, he wouldn't do things that are, not, are forbidden until Shabbat was over. But the tefillah you could do earlier, the tefillah, the kiddush, and you could call it Yom Haga Shavuot in the kiddush, and even say the Avdalah. Yeah, with the Avdalah, Mavdil Ben Kodesh Oh, okay, that was my question. <laughs> okay. Okay, so the only thing we have to wait till after the stars are out for then is um, reading the food. Yeah. Reading the food, we can actually even kiddush and everything can be done. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and if okay. Um, technically, if you put the food uh, b- during Shabbat and you still eat from it on Shabbat, if you if it's already cooked, uh, it's not a it's not a problem of achana. 
Um, I, I want to say just in general about this issue of hachana uh, from uh, from Shabbat to Yom Tov. There's a lot of a concern about that uh, among people saying, okay, you can't, let's just set the tables uh, or or other things that um, that would be hachana mi Shabbat Yom Tov. So I discussed it in the past, um, especially regarding Pesach, because Pesach is a, is a big issue for people, the second Seder, uh, when the first night falls on Shabbat, the then the second Seder is on Motzei Shabbat, and it's not just uh, you know putting the tablecloth and 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 getting out some some uh, utensils. No, it's it's a, it's a it takes a lot of preparation. So I did some research and found the teshuva of Rabbi uh, Palachi of Turkey, uh, who writes in the 15th century, and he says that um, when you have no choice and it is not done in, in done in a way which is disrespectful for Shabbat. Then there's no problem of achanami Shabbat lehol. When we say the 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 real issue of achanami Shabbat leyom tov of preparing. Wait, what is okay? This my recording has stopped, so I'm going to do a new uh, the audio one for uh, for the Shabbat discussion. Um, the real problem with achana. Uh, Preparing from Shabbat to Yom, to uh, before Shabbat is for something that you're not allowed to do on Shabbat. So, for example, if you are going to travel on Motzei Shabbat and you prepare what is necessary for your traveling, then it is a problem. Um, <clears throat> or doing construction or anything like that. But if you're uh, preparing for celebrating the holiday which if, if the holiday was today, you would have been able to celebrate it today, then there's no problem of preparing from Shabbat Leom Tov. That would be, that would be fine. Okay. Um, Sorry, one, one last quick question. Yes. As far as the candle lighting then, but if, then if, you're, if you're making Kiddush, but you haven't said the bracha on the candle for the Chag yet, because we can't pass the fire yet, or do we do it on the yard side candle? That we're lighting? You could do it on the yard side candle. Okay. And you don't have to light, I mean, so you're, you're asking about lighting Yom Tov candles. Yes. Okay, so we should know that lighting candles for Yom Tov is a very, very late minhag. It is separated of, from lighting Shabbat candles by almost 1,500 years, no less, maybe 1,400 years. The rabbis mandated late lighting Shabbat candles because they wanted people to have light at home for Friday night. They didn't mandate it for Yom Tov because you could light, you could carry and 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 move uh, <coughs> fire from an existing or a flame or use the coals or anything like that. So they were not concerned about Yom Tov, uh, and therefore there are still places where there are still communities who don't light candles for Yom Tov or who don't say the bracha. And in that interview of uh, it was Rabbi Tawil Me'alia Kohen uh, when they asked about the electricity on Yom Tov, they Someone asked, so what about, what about candles? He says, we just flip the switch. Um, that is, if, if, it's on, um, if it's on a regular day, so for on Shabbat, you just wait until Shabbat is over and then you light the candles. Okay, so let us go, let us go to, uh, to Chot Shabbat. We are now, <clears throat> We're now reading um, Siman Resh Mem Dalet 244 in Shohan Aruch. We started it last week. Eze melachot yechol ha'en Yehudi la'asod ve'ad ha'Yisrael. So, in, in general, I mean, to recap the, the rules, in general, we said that the... Uh, the prohibition of asking a non-Jew to do work for you is a rabbinical one. By biblical law, you could ask either a hired hands or a friend to do anything for you. But the rabbis created a fence because they were afraid that people were carried away and do everything regularly on Shabbat. So all the legal fiction that we use, saying indirectly, etc., is actually part of the system. The um, we spoke about the difference between doing something publicly or privately, whether people know or don't know that you do it. Um, and 
whether it's done in the house or down outside. So it also uh, makes a difference whether it's the, uh, the choice of the, of the person who performs the work or your choice. For example, uh, if, you have a, if you have a cleaning person who comes to clean the house on Shabbat, or let's say that person works every day, and you say, you know, the floors need to be clean. That person has the choice whether to sweep the broom or use a vacuum. They can do either. It's their time. It's their choice. You could say, I don't want you to use the vacuum on Shabbat because it bothers me, uh, or guests are here. But if you're not at home or it doesn't bother you, you don't, you don't have the obligation to tell them to stop. But it's all part of how you feel your spirit of Shabbat at home is. Um, so that is just a, a recap of 244, which we spoke about last week. And I'll go to 245. Uh, that is an important thing. What do you do when you have partnership uh, of a Jew or a non-Jew? Now we are assume here that a Jew who owns a store and he's the sole owner would uh, would close it on Shabbat. Um, but partnership is more complicated. The truth is that even you know, today, even with the with sole ownership, you could have problems. Uh, sometimes you have you're the owner, but there are shareholders, or there are other elements involved. Um, so we'll just go through the general rules as they're mentioned here, and we'll see how uh, they apply to our situation today. So the Shohana Ruch says this, Yisrael ve'eno Yehudi, she'esh la'im sadeh, o tanu, o merhatz, o rechaim shalmayim b'shutafut, o shem shutafim b'chanut b'shura. So this Jew and a non-Jew own, in as partners, a field or an oven, or a bathhouse, or a mill, here we're talking about a water mill, or they, uh, they have partnership in a store. They're doing, uh, they're selling merchandise. <clears throat> if they have to make a condition when they start the partnership that the uh, the income, the the profits of Shabbat will belong to the Nanju, and the profit of one other day of their choice, any day, would belong to the Jew alone, and the rest, the other five days, they would share. And but if they did not make this condition, when they are about to uh, split the profit, the Nanju takes all the profit of Shabbat, and the rest should be divided among them. And if they don't know uh, how much money comes in on Shabbat, the Nanju takes one-seventh of the total profits and the rest they, they share. So uh, the bottom line or the, the uh, rule of thumb of this halakha is that the Jew cannot derive benefit from Shabbat itself. So the profit of Shabbat goes to the Nanju. However, if they make a condition in the beginning, they already uh, made an exchange. They, they set them apart. I get Shabbat, um, sorry, you get Shabbat, I get Sunday, for example. Uh, but they have to do it beforehand. The Haggah says, ויש מתירים השכר בדיעבד. אפילו לא יתנו וחילקו סתם. Some say that even if you did not make a, this condition, I will take this day, you will take that day, it's still okay. And I think that if he says that if this causes great losses, you could rely on them. Meaning you start the partnership, you didn't make that condition, and now you're about to split the profits. The Haggah says you could rely on uh, that opinion that you could still take, uh, split it. Basically, they're splitting it evenly. They're not, um, they're running it as partners and they split when we, when we come to the end of the day, they split it half-half. Um, but then he adds, he adds another opinion. We are talking about people who actually work in the store, each one on his, own, on his day. So they have to attend to customers. But if both of them work in the store all week, 
and on Shabbat, it's only the non-Jew there, they could split the profit uh, equally. However, should not stake directly the income of Shabbat, meaning if they, let's say they split the income uh, every day, so the, non-Jew, the, the Jew cannot come on Sunday morning and say, okay, how much money you made yesterday, let's split it, but they have to do it splitting the total uh, gains of the week. What do we learn from this discussion, the back and forth? Again, it's about perception and not about prohibition. The whole idea here of making profit on Shabbat, if you didn't work, if the store was running on its own with employees, with your partner, there's really not a problem. It's, uh, it's just a question of perception. And the perception here is has a dual direction, external and internal. It's how do people view it? You want people to view it in a way which is respectful to Shabbat. But we also want you, the owner or the partner, to feel that you gave uh, Shabbat a special status, that you're not taking it lightly. Um, today, there are many, uh, in Israel, it's, it's a different story. In Israel, it's a combination of politics on one hand, a lot of pressure from different parties, and also um, sort of a status quo of many uh, establishments that are owned by Jews, by Orthodox Jews, and that operate in Jewish neighborhoods. Outside Israel, it's different. You have a lot of businesses that are owned by Jews only or co-owned by Jews and who serve broad populations. And, uh, and many of them, even if they want to, uh, to stop activity on Shabbat, to close their businesses, they cannot do that because they, they have stores in malls where they, everybody has to open seven days a week. So what do you do there? The, the owners usually go to a rabbi who sits with them and writes some kind of a contract where there's partnership. <clears throat> if the, um, the problem arises when the, uh, the owner doesn't have a partner, then uh, and, and the Jew is the only uh, owner of the business, so then they have to come up with a, with a different solution of creating a partner and uh, sharing with this partner some of the profits, but not uh, 50-50. The, uh, those of you who live in LA, or I think a lot of you on the West Coast know the, uh, the chain, the coffee bean and the tea leaf. Um, so this chain is owned by, a, by an Orthodox Jew. And um, yeah, it's funny because um, I'm saying is, you know, in parenthesis, there was a time when um, uh, anti-Israel protesters called on people to stop buying coffee from Starbucks, and they say go instead to to the coffee bean. They didn't know that coffee bean is much more Jewish and from than than Starbucks. That was uh, that was really funny. But in any case, the um, the owner created some kind of a contract of partnership. And there's only one store that closes, and that's the one in La Brea, in the uh, more orthodox area of um, of Los Angeles. All the other stores operate regularly on Shabbat. So here we have a, sort of a um, an anomaly in the orthodox community, or something that would not have happened in Israel. In Israel, if if uh, if, a, if a chain like Kofix, for example, opens in Tel Aviv but not in Yerushalayim the Haredi community will ban it. Nobody will buy it uh, by there on Shabbat or on a regular day on Yerushalayim or Tel Aviv. But in LA, everybody knows that the coffee bean is open all over town, but the, the store that is in the Frum neighborhood is closed, it's okay. So we keep buying there and they go during the week and ask for Chalav Yisroel and everybody's happy. So um, there is a remedy for that. And I get questions. Um, this is this is common. Um, well, a lot of my uh, former congregants are still friends. Uh, go to Las Vegas 
for uh, for conventions. So they have uh, they have the um, the question of what can I can I uh, have my booth? Can I have my display? Um, can I be present there personally? What about people who work for me? So the answer is that with employees, the employees can keep on working, and the owner, if he has to be there, he has to be there, uh, not doing anything which is directly transgression of Shabbat. So of course, all these things have to look look at the details of what exactly is being done. The um, the the rule to remember is that there's no prohibition against making money on Shabbat. There is a concern about preserving the. Uh, the uh, the atmosphere and the the honor of Shabbat, and also of not uh, doing anything that is directly forbidden on Shabbat. So that is something that people have to be careful about. Um, um, Rabbi. Yes. <clears throat> um, I have a question. Really, this this is an area where perception versus prohibition is um, is it just seems very very fuzzy because mm-hmm. it um i guess in a, in a matter of speaking it's a matter of who's doing the perceiving <coughs> but <coughs> when you're trying to um establish some sense of uh uh shabbat i can see in israel maybe but in the united states i i just can't see it out, outside of heavily jewish communities I can't see even where the perception by some would make a difference no you're right so so you have to consider in every community what is <clears throat> how do people uh, understand and tr- treat Shabbat and uh, whether they would be judgmental and I think I mentioned also before that the idea of perception has changed in our days because uh, information is so easily uh, inseminated. Uh, so, for example, I think there was a, a famous teshuvah, not famous, whatever. Uh, to me, it's famous uh, because I, I read, I love Rabbi Messas's writings. Rabbi Messas, uh, Messas was asked whether people could ride the metro in, in Paris. And he answered that, you know, positively, it's not a problem. And um, a, friend of his, a friend of his who was from Poland originally, or by Liner, and then relocated to Paris after the Holocaust, wrote to him saying, we have a serious problem of perception. People will think that that person who rides the metro is a transgressing Shabbat. Rabbi Messes answered, so what you have to do is publicize my ruling, and then nobody would have a problem of misperception. And that is what we can do today. Um, that is my solution to the to the umbrella that you know soon will come your way hopefully that how do you you know people think that you cannot use umbrella on Shabbat but the truth is that you can so how do you solve it simply by putting you know on your umbrella a sign Shabbat umbrella that's it so now people know that it's that it's okay um, so uh, what may I, ask, may I ask a question yes. It was related to this. So what about the issue of the perception, not of, um, of affecting an observant person's reputation, but of giving the incorrect perception um, or, or uh, idea about what is prohibited and not prohibited to somebody who wouldn't be reading anybody's teshuvah um, or might just, just might, co- might, come to think, oh, these things are okay, or see that this is okay, and extrapolate from that, that something that is, you know, desecrating Shabbat would be okay. Right. So that's a a good point. But um, the thing is, there's a question of responsibility here, right? Uh, It's a question of responsibility. One second, I'm a little distracted because my uh, my Spreaker app is cutting my recording every every ten every ten or fifteen minutes, so we will not have an, an audio regularly. Sorry, it's either a problem with the software or we're dealing with the with the issues that should not be recorded. But I still have the I still have the Zoom recording, so it's fine. Um, so, but, but back to your question, 
Um, this is also a question of responsibility. How, how much are we responsible for people's perception, right? How much are we responsible for people who are not willing to learn? Um, so I think the Midrash answers this question nicely in, um, uh, in the commentary of, of, in the first chapter of Bereshit. Let us create men in our image, in our liking. The Midrash says, Moshe asked God when writing the Torah, he said, but if you write that, people will think that there is more than one God, there's duality. And God answers, those who want to be mistaken will be mistaken, or they can be mistaken. Meaning, the um, ignorance of the law does not exempt people right from, from liability. Same here. The uh, people who are ignorant of the law, and because of them, I will not be able to do something because I'm afraid that they will do it. Uh, that's a problem. So while it's true that you should not do something that is perceived as forbidden, if you um, if you take the measures that, that are needed to make sh- to make sure that people would know what the halacha is, then you did your share. You don't have to worry about people all around the world. As long as you can advertise and and tell people, you know, the information is available, and and uh, and look at it here. Um, I had oh. Just just this week, someone asked me about a new service that started in D.C., which is called the Circulator. <clears throat> and this is something that I could we could say had been predictable. It's something that is coming up and will probably uh, soon be available in many big cities. Cities are trying to push out private transportation to bring more... Uh, good quality public transportation, electric, autonomous vehicles, etc. So this circulator bus in DC is basically a shuttle service that runs through the city. You hop on, you hop off, no payment necessary. It's free for everyone. No card, nothing. It's the DC circulator. I think it's called the circulator. It's a new, it's a new service. So what do you do with this on Shabbat? No problem. And no one can say, oh, it, it doesn't look good. I mean, this is, this is a, an interesting development because now now um, it's available for everyone, and uh, uh, nobody could even claim that there is a perception of something wrong. I want to address because I'm not recording online um, the speaker, and I, we're only with the shiul, so I want to address the question that Menashe asked, which is interesting uh, in the chat. Before we continue, he asked this: Can an entity which is legal fiction? created by the state, corporation, etc., as opposed to an unincorporated partnership of individuals, be considered Jewish, even, or maybe you didn't mean even, Menashe, even if its shareholders or members are Jewish? Did you mean in the case that they are Jewish? Um, I meant, uh, meant that, uh, can, the, can an entity be considered Jewish? because it's created as a fiction of the state, uh, even if it has Jewish owners, because the, Jew- the Jewish owners are separate individuals and they're not the, the corporation or the LLC that's created by, by the state. Okay. Um, so that I ha- I'll have to really learn and understand the, the differences between them. Um, apparently, the, the, I mean, first of all, remember that we spoke here more about perception uh, in the eyes of the community or in the eyes of the individuals. So uh, we could argue that once the legal fiction is created by the state, then uh, unless the state is Jewish, right, the, um, there would be no problem. Even if the owners are Jewish, that would be okay. That they, they would not consider it uh, Jewish. Um, so uh, what else? Yes. Um, okay. Um, I'll just add to this to, to the Marit Ein. Yes, it's a it's a big issue. People use it all the time. It's a, but I think it's important when you know the halacha, when you know it's right, to not be uh, embarrassed to do it. And if someone comes and asks a question, you say, "Here's the thing." Uh, but I I will not uh, deny that I had situations where I followed 
the halacha and and was attacked. It's it's a hobby. People like doing it. Um, okay, so let's go back to the to the Shulchan Aruch. Um, this safe dalit answers the question of the of of banking, but not Jewish banks. Yechol Israel iten leeno yudi maot li tasek baem. ואף על פי שאינו יהודי, נושא ונותן בהם בשבת, חולק עמו כל השכר בשווה. So the non-Jew, so the Jew can give non-Jew money to invest, and even though he does all negotiations and investments on Shabbat, he could share the profit with the Jew, because uh, this is not a task that was uh, a task of the Jew, and meaning that this kind of agreement is not uh, something that I have to do and instead I ask you to do it for me, but either you're doing it on your own and we share the profit. This resembles a little bit the solution to charging interest that the rabbis came up with, which is called Heter Iska, and that is something that all the Jewish banks sign, so they will be allowed to charge interest of their customers. And Heter Iska works in that manner. The assumption is that the Torah did not want Jews to charge money for using their money. That's the uh, the meaning of the name of the word usury, that uh, I'm charging you for using my money. This was understood as forbidden. <clears throat> However, they realized that without the incentive of interest, people will not loan, will not lend money, and the... the uh, the economy will suffer, and everybody will suffer because of that. <clears throat> so they created this legal fiction called Eteriska, which is, we turn the loan into an investment, a shared investment. I give you money, you take the money and invest it, and we share the profits. Of course, you have to return the capital, and 50% or 10 or whatever percent of the profits. So where is this thing? This thing is that the deal is a deal, a shared investment, only if you make profits. But if you lost, you have to cover all the losses and pay me back the capital and the alleged profits. So here it's again, it's a, probably a question of perception. We reframed the, the process. Um, it's legal fiction. And we're doing it. So we are also... They use it on Shabbat. They say the, the non-Jew is operating for himself and I'm getting the profit. It is okay. Um, okay. So, again, the, 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 uh, the examples that they have of commerce and partnership, some of, some, of, some of those are applicable today, some are not. You have to study the the structure of the company or the partnership, but um, the basic rules are there. Uh, asking a non-Jew to do something for you on Shabbat is rabbinical. Making money on Shabbat is not forbidden. Um, and you have to be able to uh, balance it in a way that does not uh, harm the uh, the character of Shabbat. The, but as I said before, Saif Dalet, number four here, is uh, what the banks are doing today. They're basically investing money for us. Not that we see, I don't see much of it, but uh, um, but the idea is that right, the bank the banks invest for the people. So the question comes, um, is being brought up, what happened with a, with a Jewish bank, Jewish owned bank that operates? Um, yeah, the branches, the the offices are closed on Shabbat, but the investments uh, continue, the gains continue. The answer is that for whatever uh, actions are being taken on Shabbat are done by non-Jews in some offices. So other, other banks completely stop operations uh, on Shabbat. The human operations, but automated operations go uh, regularly. Okay. Siman Resh Mim Vav. Mutar, so Dinah Shalav Askara, before we go there, any questions about what uh, we did so far. Those are important issues. Okay. 
<clears throat> if you come up with a question later, you could ask the question. Don't be shy. Don't worry. We're learning together. Um, renting and lending utensils or or uh, any of your stuff to the non on Shabbat. Mutar le'ashilu le'askir kelim le'eno yehudi v'afal pishu orseh ba'en melacha b'Shabbat. You could uh, rent, rent out or lend your utensils, your appliances, your tools to a non-Jew, even though he uses them on Shabbat, because we are not commanded to have our uh, possessions, our um, inanimate object rest on Shabbat. <clears throat> Some say, Shekelim Shosin Ben Melacha, Things that are used for melacha, like the melachot that are forbidden on Shabbat, asur askir leno yudi of Shabbat. You cannot give it to an Anju on Friday, because you know he's going to use it on Shabbat. Beyom hamishim mutar laskir lo, but on 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 Thursday, you could rent it to him, but don't charge for Shabbat, but rather charge for a week or a month. So again, if you ask the question, is it a prohibition or perception? The answer is perception. Because if it were forbidden, it doesn't matter if you do it on a Friday or on a Thursday. It's just that when you do it on a Friday, it's like saying, go ahead and use it on Shabbat, and you don't want to feel that you're doing that. But that is only, only about renting. But if you lend something, uh, it is okay. Saif bet is not uh, very common. Is uh, lending something to a non-Jew just before Shabbat, and now he's going to leave your house with it, and people will think that you asked him to do it. It's only if you have no roof and etc. cetera. Uh, animals, uh, any of us there, I mean, I know actually some of our people in the, in the program have animals, um, but we're talking about here burden animals that I think is, is not as common today. Uh, burden animals like a donkey or uh, uh, an ox to plow the fields, not very common in our communities. I don't think we have much of a problem there. So um, that the uh, the halacha says that you should not do because because you we have to have our animals should rest on Shabbat as well. Um, let's skip the animals. Okay, some people wanted to compare cars to animals. No comparison. We're talking about animate objects, non-animate objects. There's no problem there. Um, uh, I think we, we spoke already. Oh, the the male, male on Shabbat. In Saif Aleph, it says, You could send a letter with a non-Jew even Friday, close to sunset. But that is when you, he charges you a set fee for the task and not per hours, etc. Now there are a lot of details here, but all of them come from a, from a, a period where uh, sending letters or mail was a private business, was a private enterprise. And um, the system as we know it today didn't exist. Uh, there was, I mean, there was always a... a a royal service, the, the Persian uh, um, royal mail service or messenger service, the Roman one, the uh, the Jews at the time of the uh, of the Golden Age in Spain, the very elaborate system, sending letters with captains, uh, writing in codes. There, they had different ways to uh, send information. Today, most of this uh, service is automated. Um, it, you you started you drop you drop mail someone picks it up it's you, we don't actually ask someone to do it for us on Shabbat and obviously the postal service in Israel is not working on Shabbat some say it doesn't work at all during the week uh, either but that's the complaint of Israelis we're not getting into it now um, so yeah I think we're 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 good with the with mail on Shabbat. Any questions about that? Right. So, Aaron, we spoke about last last week. Uh, if if something arrives on Shabbat, 
Um, oh, you want to know if you if you could use it, right? So the answer is yeah, you can use it. It's not nolad, and I say why. Um, so, so that's a very good question. So what I'm, I'm reading the, you see the, the, the text that Aaron sent. Is it, uh, can you use on Shabbat of Yom Tov if it arrived then? Or is it like nolad, like an egg laid on Shabbat? So uh, the, the idea of nolad is mentioned specifically regarding Yom Tov. The, and the idea of muktzeh is an idea that starts on with Shabbat and then borrowed to the halachot of Yom Tov. The, and both of them are rabbinical. Nolad, but nolad is sort of a subcategory of mukze. What is the idea of mukze? Mukze comes from the word katze, and and it means to be separated. There was actually a physical boundary called mukze at the time of the Mishnah. That was your uh, your wood uh, firewood storage. So where you put the wood was called mukze meaning it's dedicated to that uh, task of, of um, storing, keeping the wood. The term was borrowed to Shabbat to say there are certain things that you push aside from your mind, you don't want to touch on Shabbat, and therefore they, uh, they should not be touched or used on Shabbat. <clears throat> and there are several categories, uh, things that are very expensive, like uh, a knife of a mohel, Things that are disgusting that you don't want to touch because hamat uh, mius very dirty, um, and the vachim and achtoliso and things that are used for something which is forbidden. Now, the uh, an additional category. I'm saying additional, not in terms of uh, aggregate value, but rather uh, sort of a developed after time. Even though they, we, we find it almost at the same time with the Mishnah, but it's obviously a concept that evolved out of this concept, uh, is that of things that were not accessible on Friday and became accessible on Shabbat, such as fruits on the tree. The fruits fell on Shabbat, uh, during Shabbat. So we say on Friday they were not accessible. Now, even though you didn't do anything, you still cannot touch them. It's a rabbinical prohibition and not a biblical prohibition. And technically unless, if not for the fact that the rabbis uh, explicitly said not to use it, technically, if I would have looked at the tree on Friday and said, I know that some of these fruits are going to fall down, and when they fall down, I want to eat them, that would be okay. This system is actually used by some devout Jews in Jerusalem when they want to throw stones at cars that drive on Shabbat, they put the stones aside and they say, even though you cannot touch stones on Shabbat, this particular stone I want to throw at the car, right? Of course, it's forbidden. I'm just... Uh, um, so here, I'll, I'm, I'm in the way to answer Aaron's questions, I want to give an example that is, seems to be like fruit, but is not. What if I put clothes to dry? Uh, what if I put, you know, on a... Um, on a cloth line, which is very common in Israel, or in a dryer, dryer without a, a light when you open it. What if I put that, but let's go with the cloth line, very common in Israel. Everybody has, you know, everybody's hanging stuff outside. Um, it's very, uh, it's very good ecologically, but it doesn't work in America because it, it destroys the environment from a visual point of view. Um, the, my first, our first apartment in, in, in Bogota, we did that. We just let, let the, uh, t- you know, big towels and blankets hanging, you know, out the windows. And we got a phone call from the, uh, from the administrator that it ruins the uh, visual appearance of the building. And we felt like the, you know, the farmers who came to town. Anyway, um, so what happens when you, when you put, you know, you have clothes on the clothing line before Shabbat and they got dry during Shabbat. Could you take them off or not? Or what if it rains? Can you remove it before it rains? The answer is that if you had in mind that you want them and you're going to pick it up from the from the from the clothesline when it's dry, you could remove them on Shabbat even when it rains. So it's all about the designation that you have in mind for them. Now, 
what is the exception for that process of designation or or rejection when the things is completely inaccessible so the fruits on the tree are there on friday if you want them you could go and pick them up now you didn't do it that's why they're completely out of out of boundaries but the the example of the famous egg uh, those who studied Masechet Yom Tov, or it's called Masechet Beitza, no, this is the first Mishnah, Beitza Shanoldav Yom Tov, Bet Shama Urim Te'achel, Bet Yilorim Lo Te'achel. So if, if an egg was laid on Yom Tov, Bet Shama said you can eat it, Bet Yilorim said you cannot eat it. It took me uh, about 24 years of my life to first, to ever see an egg that was laid on Yom Tov. That was, I was in Kiryat Gat, went to say Birkat Ha'ilanot on Pesach, in a house of someone who had chickens, and they said, oh, for the first time I see a real egg that was just laid, an egg, a Yom Tov egg, right? So they say, you cannot use it on Yom Tov. Why? Because it's nolad. It's a new thing. It's a newborn thing that wasn't here before. And now, it really wasn't here before because it was formed overnight. It, if you would have uh, slaughtered a chicken earlier, you might have found an almost made egg but not with a complete shell as, uh, as when it's being laid. And that's, that's the mukte of nolad, which is forbidden. Now, this concept of nolad was, uh, some people tried to apply to electricity and some, you know, with success, some, would, some said it doesn't, doesn't apply. It's, it's really because they wanted to make it forbidden. Some wanted to apply it to rain, that falls on Yom Tov or on, on Shabbat. Could you drink? You know, people used to drink rainwater. Uh, not recommended today. Rainwater comes with a lot of, uh, of residue that we don't want. You don't want to filter it. But back then, they used to drink it. The question is, could you use it or not? Could you pick up snow from the ground and, and let it melt and drink it? And the answer was yes. Um, uh, and, and, and yes, I know you have, you, you could collect the water and filter them or, but I'm just saying in, in areas of, of, uh, of great pollution, you'll be surprised of, of what, what color the water has. Um, and the answer was, the water was inaccessible to you, but they're not no lad. They were in the world. They were the same water that you have now was there before. And therefore it's not no lad and you could use the rain, the, the hail, snow, whatever. Now take this and apply it. This is what I think that we could apply it to those packages that arrive from Amazon on Shabbat. You order it and you know the date, you know when it's going to arrive. You're thinking about it, especially if you have a child at home, that kid will go and open the door seven times to check if the, the package is out there, right? So you're thinking about it. You can take it, you can open it, you could use it on Shabbat if necessary, especially if it's food and perishable. You don't have to, uh, to lose money because of that. So I think that would be okay, and it's not uh, nolad. So um, let, let me ch- just check one second where we are in Shohan Aruch. I think we've, we've finished one important, yeah. Okay, so the next, the next uh, Saif 288 is the things that you do before Shabbat, embarking on a ship, on a cruise, uh, on a journey, um, there are interesting details there. We can talk about it next week, Bezot Hashem. Um, and we can conclude here. Any any more questions? I have to send another email to remind people to use the link that is a permanent link because I did send a reminder and I think some people fell off the grid, sort of. Uh, no pun intended, Shana. Um, but okay, I think we're good. Um, Hak Shavuot Sameh, Happy Shavuot, everyone. Remember what we said in the beginning, sleep well. Make sure that your Limut Torah is, is uh, alert and energetic. Um, I'm sending, I'll, I'll be sitting late tonight to finish my commentary on Ruth. So um, I'm just, I hope you'll enjoy it. I would love to hear your feedback. I'll send it tonight. Uh, I had one in Hebrew and translation in English, which could be better, but I hope it's good. So. Uh, looking forward to hear from you. All the best. Laila Tov. Shabbat Shalom. Hak Sameach. Bye. Laila Tov. Shabbat Shalom. Hak Sameach.